Hi, Paul from Foil Drive here, and today we're doing a masterclass on understanding your remote and working with the board and the type of materials to get the best out of both and get up on foil as easy as possible. Let's do it. We've got an range of boards here. I personally ride all of them for different things, and I'm always in the water testing different stuff, so it's good to get a range of boards. I'm 96 kilos, six foot two. These boards all have their own pros and cons, and I'm just gonna go through some of them now to give you an idea as to how this has any relevance to the controller. The foil drive inspired axis board has amazing signal. It was designed to work really well. Despite it being full carbon, it has really good signal. It also has big, long plastic board tracks. It's a 60 litre, 5.4 by 19 and a half. Then I've got this Starboard Blue Carbon Series. Um, this board is a little bit more challenging with signal, but again, if used correctly, it's fantastic. If not used correctly, it can be a little bit temperamental. So it's a 5.2 by 50 litre, and I personally ride this quite a bit because it's such a lightweight board. Stepping down into the new Unifoil Quiver Killer, um, pretty appropriate name. It's a great board, does pretty much anything. It's a 5.2 by 19, but it's a 45 litre. Again, it's carbon fibre, but they use plastic tracks like most brands do. So the signal is also really good. Again, work with the technology and it's great. That moves into the apple tree. So the apple tree, again, it's a full carbon board, but it's smaller. I'm 96 kilos, everything I get on that's sort of sub 50 liters, pretty much just sinks. So we're gonna use this as a great analog of how to work with the board and the controller to get it going and still be able to use a smaller board. So the stats on this one is it's a 4.6, it's only 35 liters. So it's gonna sink real easily on my body weight. And then the last one of the lot, which is the Takuma board, the Rising Sun, it's a 30 liter, it's only a 4.2 by 18 and a half. Before today and the release of the patch antenna, I couldn't use this board because of the signal block out because this, out of all the five here, is the only one that uses full carbon tracks. So I'll be using the patch antenna on that and demonstrate how I can even use a board of this silly size. It's also worth mentioning that not all brands make things in the same way with the same carbon, the same material, or the use of carbon. So you might have a carbon board with a carbon box, but plastic tracks is a very different scenario to a carbon board with a carbon box with carbon fiber tracks. And then there are other people that will do carbon fiber tracks, but they won't have a carbon fiber box. It's all over the place. So that's why some people say, well, it works for me, and other people with carbon tracks say it doesn't work for them. So again, fantastic news about the patch antenna. It deletes all that anyway, but we're just trying to educate the general public on not all carbons the same, no, no two boards are laid up identical either, hence why there can be differences. So it's worth remembering that we live in a dynamic world and there's always some subtle differences between all sorts of different things. I will be doing some paddling technique, some controller placement technique, some board adjustment technique out in the water with the mic on to hopefully make this really easy and intuitive. And I hope it helps a lot of people out there get the most out of the system. All right, so I'm wearing the silly hat again with the microphone taped under the brim, but it should allow you to hear me very easily. So first of all, we're gonna take out the apple tree, the four five by 35 liter um, prone board. And this is full carbon through and through. Doesn't have carbon tracks, but this one does need a little bit of attention to detail when it comes to signal. And we're gonna go through that and show you how it's done. Go! Okay, so I'm on the apple tree on the um, 4.6 by 35 litre. And I'm using the code 1130 because it's just a nice high lift wing and we're just mucking around in the marina here. And I don't want to fall off too many times and wet the mic. So I'm going to make it a little easier for myself. And we're running the No Limits V2 fully integrated foil drive mast. Um, just an epic combination, super light. So let's get into it, full carbon board and it does need a little bit of attention to where you put the controller. So I'm gonna hop on the board now and be frustrated 
because it's not working. And then I'm gonna show you what I'm doing wrong. And then I'm gonna show you what I need to change to do it right. So, if the board is under the water, it should be no surprise that the controller won't work. First thing, don't sit there doing this. Come on, come on, come on. The controller needs to see signal to the box for at least one second for it to link and then it'll allow you to get throttle. So you might actually have link. So if I bring the board out a bit, now I've got connection. If I was to have the board submerged, I've lost link and I sit there doing this and then the board comes out of the water where I should be able to get link, it won't work. Just relax, pull the throttle and it works. So mashing the controller is some people's problems is, is, is as simple as that. Just don't mash the controller, allow it to get link. When I'm trying to get a complete sinker board going, again, I can't have the control up here and expect it to work. For me personally, I'll put the controller on the surface of the board and I sort of grab the nose and I put the controller down like, like you're laying it on the table. So then I've got a good hold of the nose, but I can also get to the throttle with this finger. So that'll work above the water, but really cool is it'll work below the water because the controller is pressed against the surface, whether it's above the water or below the water, you've kind of got the antenna as close as you can get it. There will be some boards that will not link up when the controller is pressed against the surface and the board is fully submerged. Again, every board is slightly different. There's very few of them, but I have been on one which had to have the nose at least out. So I'm gonna demonstrate getting frustrated and not being able to go, so come on. Oh, now I've got some link and I can get going and then I'm going to paddle too slowly and it cuts out. Remember, if you're trying to paddle, you've, depending on the setting you put in your foil drive, I've set mine to cut off after 300 milliseconds. So if I'm gonna paddle, I need to paddle a little bit quicker than a sort of a really slow, lazy paddle. If I paddle quickly, I can maintain link and it'll work perfect. So I'm gonna do that now. So I'm gonna get link on the board, get it moving. Even with the board submerged, cuts out. So the board was submerged, it cuts out. So I need to have the nose out if I want to do this. So I'm going to get going and I can paddle. No problem. So it's all about the speed. If your arms are coming in and out of the water within the correct amount of time, the link goes on, off, on, off. But that 300 millisecond pause, it gives you 300 milliseconds of grace. Now you can turn that up to as much as 500 milliseconds, so half a second in the app, and it gives you more leeway. But just remember, keep it to a safe level because the motor will continue to run for that period of time once it's lost link. So now I'm going to demonstrate how I get up on foil. We had a clip of this in the masterclass about keeping the board flat. But first of all, I'm gonna do it all wrong too far back in the board, I'm just going to stall the wing. Full throttle, just going nowhere. Trying to get to my knees too soon. Doesn't work. It's not powerful enough. Well, it's not powerful enough when the board's on like a 30 degree, 40 degree angle, acting like a massive shovel, just pushing water you need to keep it flat. So I'm going to do the same thing this time, but I'm going to keep my body over the surface of the board and deliberately keep it flat. So cruising along, body over the nose, let it build speed. And now I can easily get up.
So do that again to stay over the nose. Sometimes you'll find if you're a lighter person, or in this case, you're running a big wing, too much throttle can be too much to handle. You probably saw then I got lift, a little bit too much lift and I backed off the throttle a little bit. Came down, that's okay. As long as you got speed, you can skip off the water and keep going. So again, you need to have your body weight over the nose to keep the board flat. If you keep the board flat, the wing can build speed. If you can build speed, you can generate lift. It has to be that way. I also make sure that I have boost available. So I'm not going above 95% throttle here. And I only engage boost once I'm moving. Now I've got full throttle, waiting for the board to build speed. And I hop up. And once I'm up and once I'm planing, doesn't matter if the board's touching or not, I've got plenty of speed and you're good to go. Another little trick when you're trying to transition from speed to foil and no motor, it's just a little subtle pop. You don't need to do an aggressive maneuver. Build your speed, pop, pop it back in. Remember, pre-engage the props under the water or above the water. Try not to do it. Try not to do it half in, half out like I did then. Okay. So again, for total clarity, there's no link. The board comes out of the water. I've got link and I pull the controller. I get thrust. If I've lost link because the board is below the water and there's nothing and I keep mashing the throttle and I bring the nose up, even though I can see on my controller I have link, that motor will not start until you stop, wait for a full second then you can pull the throttle and go. So we've solved a number of people's lack of signal because they just didn't understand that relationship or the feeling that the link is sometimes really good and then other times it doesn't work. It just turns out that the relationship of that connection before it will allow you to safely start. Why does that happen? The reason is, is that if you didn't, if we didn't do it that way and you still had throttle on and the nose of the board comes up, see I've got link now but I've got 90% throttle on, it would then just take off. So I have perfect signal but I've still got the trigger pulled down. Let it off, one and two, pull the trigger and it runs. This is particularly useful if you're duck diving under a wave. So I grab the rail of the board, I motor along and there's a wave coming, it allows me to actually push the board up and under, but I've still got my finger on the trigger and the motor's still running because I've kept the controller pressed up against the surface of the board. If you tried to duck dive with the controller out here, you'll probably lose link when you go underwater, see? There's no, no throttle. Put it here, throttle. So that's super helpful. Um, well, I find it very helpful when you're trying to go out through big swell, you can motor under the wave. I hit the bottom. <laughs> I have to go out a bit. So when the board's under the water and I've got no link, put the controller on the deck, get link. Once I get it moving and the surface of the board becomes exposed, I can be a little bit more li liberal with where I put the remote. I've got a little bit more 
leeway once the board's out i can actually afford to take the remote up off the surface sometimes some boards still require you to have a little bit closer and others you can get a little bit more sort of friendly with how far away you have the controller but if i was to dip the board under again completely submerge it it cuts out so you will have to find out for your board for your riding style what works for you but for me personally i always just start with the remote on the deck get the thing moving build some speed then get my body over allow it to build speed staying flat then i'm actually backing the throttle off a little bit standing to my feet building the throttle back up okay so i've just come in and we i've just changed to the 980 because the 1130s just got so much lift it's hard to demonstrate when you want to do the double overhanded paddle to get a smaller board up on plane um, I need a little bit less lift to show that um, we have actually had to switch to the max power battery because we ran out of sport batteries but it's on the same power setting I'm running um, max power so when I'm out in the water on a small board again 4 6 35 liter 96 kilos it's just going to sink so I need to get the board moving, get the nose out of the water so that I've got good link. And when I'm actually moving and I'm transitioning over the water, then I can afford to take the controller off and do some overhanded paddles. If I try and do it too early, when everything's still sinking in the water and not above, it might cut out. So I want to get moving as fast as I can before I start paddling, get my body weight over the nose to keep it flat and the water will drain off the board and it gives me the best possible signal and the best chance of getting up. So again, on these smaller prone boards, my body weight, everything is submerged and I need to get the nose of the board out of the water, like so, to give myself the best chance of getting signal. So I'm now gonna turn around, try and get up to full speed with the throttle and then I'll start paddling so that I've got best signal. So nose is out the water, through the throttle. Now I can paddle. Because I had the speed and the water had drained off the board, I had very good signal and I could get that paddling done and made that all possible to do so if I tried to do it too early it just cuts out because the board sinks the nose is gone I lose my signal and it's just it's really hard so again get going get the board out of the water then build the throttle up and you're off Now that was all very easy, but if I took the foam out of the tracks in this board, my signal would dramatically reduce. So please remember, foam in the tracks is really important. Even if you can't be bothered, just put it in there. In front of, in the middle, and behind the bolts, if you're having any struggles, fill the whole track up. Obviously find the mast position where you want it to be, but don't be afraid to fill the whole track up, and you can get quite a decent signal improvement. Um, and I can't stress this enough. If, if I took the foam out now, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of this. Um, it really does help. Obviously, the Takuma board, which we're about to demonstrate, doesn't matter how much foam I put in there, um, those carbon tracks won't work and I'm fully reliant on the patch antenna. Okay, so we've got the Takuma Rising Sun 4.2 by 30 litre. This has been our go-to board since we found out about it for testing signal. It's the most impenetrable board we've ever found. Um, and it is unusable, unfortunately. Uh, without the patch antenna, prior to this point, totally unusable. So we're gonna demonstrate that in the water and then we're gonna put the patch antenna on and just show how much of a massive difference it makes. Even with it sitting on the surface as it is now, you can 
just find some spot. Well, there's a tiny spot there. Occasionally you can find some length, but the problem is as soon as you lie on it, in any capacity, it's just totally non-responsive. I've spent hours on this thing trying to get signal to go through it and unfortunately it just doesn't work. So the only way you can occasionally get signal is to empty all the water off the surface and move the controller around Even now, I'm struggling to get it to okay, right down the back over the top of the unit. Oh, there we go, got some link. But unfortunately, that's not usable in the water, so it just will not run. But we put the patch antenna on, and then the board is perfectly usable, and it's fantastic. Again, the patch antenna on the surface of the board. If this controller is anywhere within the vicinity of it, you're going to have length. But if it's under the water, even though the controller's a fair way away from it, if it's off the surface of the board, it's not much use to me. If I get it near the patch antenna, I've got length. Anywhere near the cable, you get length. So the cable itself actually has an impact. But again, if I go way off the surface of this board, there's no connection because the board itself doesn't transmit. So it's got to be near or on the patch or anywhere around here and you're going to have a link. So moving the controller around the surface of the board like you can on other boards won't make much difference when you're dealing with a board that has carbon track issues. You've got to come back close to the antenna and the cable. The end cable is, is inductive, as is the antenna. But as soon as the antenna comes out of the water, I've got signal anywhere. So that's about it. As long as you can see the antenna out of the water, you're going to have signal. It's going to be fantastic for winging, it's going to be fantastic for downwinding when you're standing on a tall board with a paddle. And look, in any case, if you're using the patch antenna, you're just going to get amazing signal. Um, it just boils down to whether or not you think it's needed in your case. And if it is, it's available. And if not, enjoy your Gen 2 the way it is. Thanks for listening. Well, that's a wrap. Hopefully that'll make sense. If you do have any further questions, our support team is always there. Send us an email or give us a call. I'm always happy to help. But I think now that we've got the technology in place and the understanding, you shouldn't have any issues and you should be able to get out there and have as much fun as you possibly can. Thanks for listening. Until next time.